name is Paul Drover. I'm actually president of the Mortar Mystery Society. Uh, professionally, I'm principal record specialist in medieval records at the National Archives in Kew, and I'm a kind of medieval historian. My own research was on Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March, and he is basically the topic of my two papers today. So the first half, which is called The Flickering Flame, deals with Roger's early career, his, his childhood, his ties to the court and to uh, missions in Ireland and Wales, and then the second half, which is much more the period which he's better known for, deals with his period of ascendancy between 1327 to 30, relationship with Queen Isabella, possibility that he was the, you know, the murderer of Edward II, and just, just details all of his uh, acquisitiveness, greed, that kind of stuff, and then like, finishes off with his downfall and execution. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your patience. We've only got a short while to go, hopefully. Um, we're going to now move to probably the most famous, if brief, period in the history of the medieval Mortimer family. The period of ascendancy of Roger Mortimer, first Earl of March. Now in the second half of this talk, I'm going to look at the consequences of Mortimer's rebellion against Edward II, his invasion alongside Queen Isabella, the overthrow of the king and power grab, the problems caused by external and internal enemies, the years of tyranny, personal aggrandizement and ostentation, and I'll end by looking at Mortimer's downfall and execution. So I hope nobody's got a train until about half seven. <laughs> <laughs> joke, joke, it's fine. Right, anyway, okay. So the Civil War of 1321, yeah, 1321 to two, that pitted crown and court against a broad spectrum of the elite of England and the marches of Wales was disastrous for the family of Mortimer of Wigmore. The machinations of the dispensers you've just heard about in the marches and um, their inability to dissuade, sorry, the Mortimer's inability to dissuade the king from pursuing the dispensers' advice and ambitions induced Roger and his uncle to risk all in open opposition to the king and his favourites. But, pressed by incursions into their lordships from Wales, the, the desertion into Wire Chase, it was said, of 10,000 Welshmen from Brecon and the lordships of Malienith, Kerry and Cadawine, and perhaps convinced that past service and personal relationships would save them from the ultimate penalty, uncle and nephew um, surrendered to Edward II at Shrewsbury on the 22nd of January 1322. Now such thoughts were quickly dashed as they were dragged off to the tower to await their fate while the Crown agents moved in to seize their lands and assets. And at the National Archives we're very fortunate to have a series of inventories of the possessions of the Mortimers seized in 1322, of which this is one. This is the goods and chattels in, uh, found in Wigmore Castle. It's also the document in which I think the, the green surcoat, which the March of Barons are supposed to have worn on their March to London in 1321, there is actually evidence in this particular document that it survived. But also things like luxury fixtures and fittings, evidence of piety, Jones wardrobe, that kind of thing. Now, um, Roger's young family also suffered from Edward's revenge spree. Now, as you can kind of see here, in the very, very top line, with a little bit hanging above, there's to Joan, the wife of Lord Roger Mortimer of Wigmore. Um, Roger's wife, Joan, initially received an annuity of £166, 13 shillings, forfeits from the king, to be taken in quarterly instalments from the 15th of February, 1322. The first of which was claimed by her knight, Richard de Burgh, on the 3rd of March. Now that seems relatively lenient. A day later though, de Burgh and one William de Ockley, possibly the man who was accused of the murder of Edward II in 1330, were allowed to accompany Joan to safe custody in Southampton. Now in April 1324, as tensions increased with France, Joan had moved from Southampton to more remote and less comfortable confinement at Skipton Castle in Yorkshire, from where she was again moved to Pontefract at the height of the invasion scare in July 1326. Meanwhile, Joan's daughters were distributed between various nunneries, including Chicksands in Bedfordshire and Sempreum in Lincolnshire. Her sons, Edmund, Roger and Geoffrey, who were approaching adulthood, were also shuttled between royal strongholds. And again, the National Archives we hold accounts relating to their removal with the sons of the Earl of Hereford, firstly to Windsor and then to Odium, Hampshire. And it gives really good detailed daily amounts of how much they're paid for food, the kind of food they're eating, the clothes they're wearing, that kind of thing. And at some point before 1326, they then found themselves in the tower. Now the tower, of course, was both the site of their father's confinement and of his redemption. And on 1st of August 1323, Roger engineered an escape, which to this day, the yeoman, the yeoman warders of the tower don't want to tell you about. I've asked them, they don't want to talk about it. 
Now, drugging his guards at Lammas Feast with the aid of Gerald de Olsmith, his jailer, Roger escaped his cell and scaled the inner and outer baileys to a waiting boat on the Thames and then was then whisked away to pick it. His three years in the wilderness on the continent allowed him to step into the vacuum created by the execution of Thomas Earl of Lancaster and many contrarian leaders in 1322 to become the de facto leader of opposition to Edward and the Dispensers. And as Catherine has shown, his association with Queen Isabella, whether amorous or not, and I kind of tend to think that it probably was, created a dynamic partnership which swept into England. And having rallied vast swathes of the population to their cause through a mixture of anti-dispenser propaganda and outright violence, including the murder on the steps of his own cathedral, of, of, not of his own cathedral, of the St. Paul's Cathedral, um, of Bishop Stapleton with a bread knife, they had mercilessly pursued and exterminated the favourites and took the fugitive king into captivity before he could raise sufficient forces or escape, probably to Ireland. Now, much of the attention, of course, has been placed upon the horrific ritual trials and executions that befell the dispensers, and Catherine described those <coughs> a moment ago. But Roger Mortimer actually singled out Edmund Fitzalan, Earl of Arran. Edmund benefited from Roger's fall, seizing control of Church, Kerry and Cudderwine in 1322, and supplanting it, uh, Roger in the middle of March. And on the 16th or 17th of November 1326, at the time that Hugh Dispenser was beginning his hunger strike, um, shortly after the King, Dispenser and Robert Baldock had been captured, John Charlton, Lord of Paris, captured Arundel near Shrewsbury and handed him over to Roger Mortimer. Now, if a handful of chronicle accounts are correct, Mortimer abandoned the formal quasi-legal proceedings that had gone against the dispensers and had Arundel summarily executed in secret out of a perfect hatred he bore towards him. Now, this gives us an impression of Roger Mortimer acting within the shadows. And certainly, although the king had placed a thousand pound bounty on his sorry, the king, yeah, the king, sorry, had placed a thousand pound bounty on his head during the invasion, and although Mortimer himself was one of the figureheads of the nobility laid low by the king and his favourites, his influence in the transition from the reign of Edward II to that of his son has to be winkled out from the sources. Now, a surviving roll of 115 letters sealed by the Queen and her son before he took governance of the realm, uh, for example, which I'm hoping to publish at some point, reveals the replacement of many royal sheriffs and castle keepers with men tied to the new regime, men such as John Travers, who took custody of Corfe and who had returned to England alongside Mortimer and Isabel. Now, Mortimer's most public show of his growing power alongside the Queen came in the Parliament of January 1322, held in Westminster, which ultimately sealed the deposition of Edward II and successfully packaged it as his abdication. So the Parliament opens on the 7th of January, the King refuses to attend, and he doesn't want to give it any kind of illegality by his presence. Five days later, the question of whether Edward's crimes were so manifest as to require his replacement um, Parliament just uh, not, isn't, isn't sure about it. The Archbishop of York and the Bishop of Rochester, for example, refused to countenance such radical measures. But the following day, a letter conveniently arrived from the new mayor of London, Richard de Bethune, one of the men implicated in Mortimer's escape from the Tower in 1323. Now, the mayor and citizens of London urged the Assembly to ally with their cause, maintain the cause of the Queen and her son, to quote, crown the latter and depose his father for frequent offences against his oath and his crown. Now, emboldened by this stage-managed intervention, Roger Mortimer gets to his feet and presents the articles of accusation against Edward II. So he announced that the magnates no longer wished to have Edward as their king due to his insufficiency, his unstinting reliance on evil counsel, his relentless destruction of holy church, and his disinheritance of the crown. Thomas Wake, Mortimer's cousin and son-in-law of Henry of Lancaster, brother and heir to the late Earl Thomas, offered vocal support. But it's Roger Mortimer who tops the list of those taking the oath to the Queen and her son at the Guildhall over the next three days. And a week later, presented with this fate accompli, the King, under Lancaster's house arrest at Kenilworth, abdicated in favour of his son, the 13-year-old Duke Edward. Now, Isabella and Mortimer's coup was then complete. The coronation of Edward III had now to proceed as quickly and as publicly as possible. So huge crowds thronged Westminster Abbey, and Roger Mortimer had the satisfaction of seeing his sons knighted beside the king in ceremonies reminiscent of those he and Edward II had undergone in 1326. <coughs> the coronation is on the 1st of February, as you can see. Two days later, Parliament opens again, and Mortimer enters a position, petition showing that his trial in 1322 had been erroneous, as he had not been allowed to answer the charges, as was his right in peacetime, and he had not been tried by his peers. Similar pleas were entered on behalf of many other now former contrarians for their mutual rehabilitation. 
a general pardons issued on the 21st of February to Roger Mortimer, and then a more specific pardon related to his escape from the Tower the same day. A week later, the Exchequer Barons were ordered to cancel all judgments against Roger and his uncle. Both men's lands were restored, and Roger was permitted to take custody of his late uncle's lands. Roger of Chirk, having sadly died in the Tower on the 3rd of August, shortly before the invasion which would have come to freedom. Mortimer had thus been restored to common law and re-established the fortunes of his family, and he was again free to reap the benefits of the exercise of lordship and engage in politics. Now, as we all know, though, this allowed his more grandiose ambitions to play out. So with the, you know, with the king uh, not, not due to reach his majority until 1333, the prospect of a long minority, as much as the memory of the previous five years, necessitated the reconstruction of government. Now, that would, that would aim to guide the king away from his father's catastrophic policies and to allow barons to reassert themselves as his natural counsellors and guardians of the honour and rights of the crown. So, a regency council of suitable wise men, elected by the great men, was convened, supposedly to be led by Henry um, Newell of Lancaster, the chief keeper and supreme counsellor of the king. The council's objectives would be to promote stability and prosperity and prepare the ground to take on the Scots and the French. Now, unfortunately, as you can see here in these quotes, if you can see them, um, the ability of the Queen directly and Roger Mortimer indirectly to control access to the young king meant that such ambitions could not be fulfilled and were actively stymied. Now, I find no evidence of Roger Mortimer sitting on the recent council Although in his trial in 1330, it said that he usurped the council's powers. So to use a modern term, we might view Mortimer exercising soft power, uh, using his relationship with the Queen to exert influence over her son. So Isabella, of course, would take a natural role as an intercessor, pleading in the case of petitioners and accompanying her son on state occasions. But she shouldn't, sorry, couldn't or shouldn't, uh, have exercised overt political influence. For her to control the levers of power, not only therefore did she need access to the king and his chief ministers, which of course she had, she had to rely on Roger Mortimer and his associates to intimidate, to cajole, and to perhaps influence the council to put any plans they had into effect. As the reign began, the steady accumulation of awards made to the pair reflected, I think, widespread acknowledgement of the pivotal roles they'd both played in the recent revolution. So within three weeks of the coronation, Mortimer had received the extremely valuable wardships of the Oldens of Warwick and Pembroke and of Nicholas Audley, with the marriage of Lawrence Hastings, the heir to the Pembroke Earldom. On the 20th of February, he was commissioned as the new Justice of Wales. That was an entirely natural appointment, given Roger's landed inheritance, his experience as a watch lord, and the residual sympathy in Wales for the deposed king. Now, to some extent, domestic stability and entrenchment of the Mortimer and Isabella's regime rested on their ability to tackle external threats posed by the Scots, who, on the day of Edward's coronation, had launched a daring, if unsuccessful, attack on Norham Castle in Northumberland. Now, this was a breach of the 13-year uh, truce of Bishopthorpe that had been sealed in April 1323. Robert Bruce aimed to put instant pressure on the new regime and poke the hornet's nest, if you will. Uh, the chronicler, based at Lanacost Priory, which is... Um, I've just gone back there, there's Lanacost. Um, in Cumberland, a repeated victim of Scottish raids, claims, though, that Bruce wished to make good on a letter from Edward, Edward II during the invasion crisis, that he might have the land and kingdom of Scotland and a large part of northern England, perhaps in an effort to bring them to his aid. So, short-term measures were taken to shore up England's northern border, um, but Roger Mortimer, for him, Scott's re repeated intervention in Ireland and the rumoured ambition of Edward II to flee to Ireland and from there link up with the Scots to mount an invasion, might have loomed equally large. Uh, so for several months, the new king's writ didn't run in Ireland, and it took a while for the new justicia, the Earl of Kildare, to take up his appointment. So the potential for trouble on several fronts for the new regime was accentuated by news from Ireland that Robert Bruce had visited Ulster for around three months from Easter 1317, raising the possibility of a uh, further assault on the English lordship there during a transition between reigns in England. So, ultimately, a test of military strength was inevitable. Summons for a muster of the English army at Newcastle on the 18th of May were issued in April, and over the next three months, the English army slowly dragged itself north, including contingents from Hainan, um, who got involved in some fighting in York. Um, Roger Mortimer's absence from court, as largely attested by witness lists to royal charters enrolled on the charter rolls, suggests that he had visited Wales himself 
to survey defences and to raise men. His departure appears to have triggered a confederacy led by the otherwise obscure James Trumwin and perhaps a link to attempts to liberate the late king, which attempted, and I quote, to do what evils they can against the king and his subjects in the Welsh marches. So combined with the uncertainty about the Scots' strengths and motives in Ulster and on the northern border, the urgency of the successful military strike became more acute. By the 15th of July, the English army had reached Durham. The Scots then cascaded into England with three battalions and swarm about. They then, basically a farcical chase ensues until the Scots are finally sighted across the, ter- across the Tyne in Stanford Park. Apart from the old skirmish, the Scots managed to avoid direct combat and they just hit and run in kind of lightning strikes, one of which allowed James Douglas to reach the young king's tent and bring the tent down upon him. Didn't quite capture him there. The English command structure in this campaign is not entirely clear, and we assume that Mortimer must, on experience grounds at least, have played a prominent role. But as, a, as at Bannockburn, disputes over precedence arose. The Earl of Norfolk, the king's uncle, for example, drawing, drawing up a schedule of his rights and privileges of Earl Marshal and captain of the vanguard during the campaign. The Brute Chronicle, a work composed under Lancastrian patronage, suggests that Mortimer had dissuaded Norfolk from arraying his forces against the Scots, when, had they done so, they would have easily defeated them. This was because he had, and I quote again, privately spoken with the Scots so that he might help them wend their way again back into their own country. Now, Mortimer had also commanded the Night Watch and ensured nothing was done, apparently. One thing Mortimer had done was to have his pardon of February 1327 inspected and confirmed with the army at Hayden Bridge on the 24th of July. Now that may not be a smoking gun, but it might support disquiet among the senior captains as to Mortimer's role and possible accusations against his influence, which he had to take some kind of insurance out against. Now hindsight's a wonderful thing, of course, and the majority of the community of the realm, from the king downwards, could point to suspicious motives once the outcome of the campaign was clear that it had failed. Uh, reluctant to expand precious resources on more futile militarism and recognising the pragmatic value of uh, conceding the independence of Scotland and Robert Bruce's title, Mortimer and Isabella entered painstaking negotiations with the Scots over the winter of 1327-8. And the result, as you can see here, is ratified by the young king, the Parliament of Northampton on the 1st of, 1320, uh, 1st of May 1328, was a treaty by which perpetual Anglo-Scots peace was, uh, was agreed. And when I say perpetual, I mean it lasted about five years. <laughs> no, four years. Um, Scottish independence in this treaty was guaranteed, and a marriage was contracted between Edward's infant sister Joan and David Bruce, the infant heir to the Scottish line. Conditions that were agreed also that, um, affected the Scots' alliance with the French, and mutual assurances made that the Scots would no longer intervene in Ireland, and the English would refrain from patronising Bruce's enemies in the Western Isles. So you can see kind of that, you know, Mortimer and Isabella aren't looking at this as a strictly Anglo-Scots thing, it's a much broader context for the conflict. The vast reparation payment of 20,000 marks made to the English king by Bruce was siphoned off, however, by Mortimer and Isabella, as revealed in the parliamentary accusations at his trial. And that makes it all too easy to be cynical about the couple's motivations. Edward III was so upset at the session of his rights of overlordship that his father is so jealously guarded that he actually refused to attend his sister's wedding. For many then and since, the Treaty and Marriage Alliance emblemised the downward spiral into which the country was falling under Isabella and Mortimer. And chroniclers kind of feel that the treaty created an atmosphere in which the Queen, mother of the King, and Sir Roger Mortimer usurped power and the um, treasurer of the realm, and they held the King under their subjection. Now, a fairly great cursory glance at the roles of Chancery in which many royal grants are recorded, reveals generally the accuracy, at least part of this claim. In Wales and the Marches, the months after, so after um, the sealing of the treaty, so either side of the sealing of the treaty, had seen a further accumulation of custodies by Roger Mortimer. So on the 13th of September 1327, he'd received a Spencer Junior's Lordship of Denby and Arundel's castles of Oswald Street and Clun, cementing his position as the preeminent power in the Middle March and the Northern March. On the 27th of August 1328, his authority was amplified by a life grant of the Justiceship of Wales. And, moreover, on the 31st of May 1328, <coughs> in lavish ceremonies at Hereford, Mortimer had married two of his daughters, Beatrice and Agnes, to the heirs to the earldoms of Norfolk and Hastings, respectively. Now, by far the most notorious and politically charged act of self-aggrandizement 
that Mortimer was able to bring about came in Parliament at Salisbury in October 1328, and Philip and Andrew have already mentioned this today. Here, the king ennobled not only his younger brother, John of Eltham, as Earl of Cornwall, and James Butler as Earl of Ormond, he also made Roger Mortimer Earl of March. Now, at one level, this simply reflected Mortimer's familial ties to the Joinville County of La Marche in France, now in the hands of his son, Geoffrey, and his status in power at court. However, it's inconceivable that this wasn't a title Mortimer had devised for himself. The analyst at St Paul's Cathedral noted that, quote, such an earldom had never been so named before in the Kingdom of England. The title surely represented his claim to widespread authority throughout the marches of Wales, um, English and Welsh, over the span of lordships, which, of course, he had no personal claim. And this was far more of an egregious assault on march status than anything Hugh Dispenser had attempted. Again, if we believe chronicle accounts, and I see little reason to doubt them, the title encouraged Mortimer to lord it over his new peers. The new earl had, quote, become so proud that he would lose and forsake the name that his ancestors had forever before. And this proved too much for the Earl of Lancaster, the senior earl, and the king's uncles, the earls of Norfolk and Kent. And in a manifesto of the 27th of September 1328, after the summons to the parliament in which Mortimer would be elevated had been issued, Lancaster argued that the king should be allowed to live of his own and have enough reserves to combat his enemies. This must be a direct accusation of peculation against Isabella and Mortimer. Secondly, the Regency Council should have its powers restored. Thirdly, law and order ought to be more stringently enforced. And then finally, the proposed parliament transferred to Westminster, where perhaps the influence of the London, Londoners might be more effectively marshalled against Mortimer. You can imagine these demands were declined. Mortimer and Isabella go down to the West Country. They start gathering troops. Lancaster stays away. Mortimer arrives with an armed force against the general prohibition. And he actually then swears on the Archbishop of Canterbury's cross in Parliament that he bore Lancaster no malice. And the king then guarantees the Earl's safety. I can see you're all persuaded by this uh, excuse. Now, Lancaster's non-attendance may have persuaded the king his honour was being slighted. An impression reinforced by an armed standoff near Winchester as the Parliament broke up. Civil war became inevitable, and it's fairly certain that that was the outcome that Mortimer and Isabella wanted. Although, having said that, there is evidence that he wasn't quite as confident, perhaps, as he, you might think. And on the 15th of December, uh, Mortimer received licence to alienate in Mortmain, i.e., to give to the dead hand of the church forever, 100 marks worth of land and rent to endow nine chaplains to celebrate daily masses at St Mary's in Lemberdine for the souls of the King, Queen Isabella and Philippa, Henry Burkhurst, Bishop of Lincoln, and for himself, his wife Joan, who you'll notice is a very silent figure in all of this, <laughs> as well as their ancestors and successors. War, basically, is then declared, and amazingly, surprise, surprise, the royal party sweep through the Midlands. Henry Earl of Lancaster is basically brought to heel, and he, makes, he surrenders, and a, and a large penalty of £30,000 is left hanging over his head if he were to rebel in future. That then, of course, brings the final two years of Roger Mortimer into a rapid expansion of his wealth and power and a constant increase in discontent and opposition. Those of you that have been to Wigmore don't need any more knowledge of this story, but the most infamous public display of his position at court came when he hosted the King and his circle at Wigmore and Ludlow in early uh, September 1329. The Wigmore Chronicle reports lavish feasting, hunting and jousting over several days, and records of the royal wardrobe show that King Edward gifted his host a handful of valuable goblets, including one emblazoned with the arms of France and Navarre. Roger returns the favour, presenting the king with a gilded goblet. Now, such gift-giving wasn't restricted to that particular occasion, and it continued a trend that had been going on over a couple of months. Roger had, in fact, been given a diamond-studded amulet on the 25th of May by the king as a parting gift as Edward goes to France to perform his homage to Philip VI. And these might be seen as tokens of growing affection between the king and Roger, or, if we're a bit more cynical, as the opportunities for, uh, for gain that Roger could exploit in his position. Certainly, they do reflect Roger's extravagant and expensive tastes. And it's around this time that at least one chronicler describes the, as you can see here, wonderfully rich clothes that Roger wears out of all manner of reason. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, now, more importantly, the Wigmore tournament is probably an occasion described in the Brute Chronicle as the round table in Wales to which all men would come there, where Roger, 
quote, counterfeited the manner and doing of King Arthur's table. Now the action probably took place in the valley below the castle with the Queen and Roger presiding, perhaps even, as Ian has suggested, with um, the pair taking on the roles of Guinevere and Arthur. The couple were certainly down for their Arthurian tastes. Their regime had a little library where they loaned out romances from a central store to courtiers. And Roger himself almost certainly aimed to repeat the round table his grandf- at which his grandfather had been presented the, uh, the gold barrels that Andrew mentioned earlier. And that was exactly 50 years uh, before this particular um, event. Now, such open and ostentatious displays of power and wealth were bound to surprise and concern people. The vainglory of Roger's transformation into Arthur was apparently even mocked by his own son, Geoffrey, who called him the King of Folly. And yet, the Mortimers were a family for whom cultural memory had a sizable role to play. Roger would proclaim an ancient Welsh ancestry, and yes, okay, maybe not really, but he claimed a blood relationship with Arthur himself, not to mention Cadwallader, the last of the British kings, and Emma kind of showed you how that actually worked genealogically, coming through his great great grandmother, Gladys the uh, daughter of Llewellyn of Europe. Now, for Roger to play Arthur had deeper dimensions, although I think we might have to take with a bucket full of salt the chronicler Geoffrey Le Baker's accusations that Roger Mortimer, quote, lover of the queen, master of the king, desired to extinguish the royal bloodline and usurp the throne himself. But, as with the creation of the, um, oh, there we are, there's the king of folly, sorry. Um, as with the creation of the Earl of March, this Ethereum uh, association theatrically strengthened a growing reality of Roger's um, increasing authority and reach in Wales and the Marches, as well as in the country at large. So as the court moves towards Wigmore in September 1329, Isabella had granted him the reversions after her death of the royal castles and lordships of Gwilf and Montgomery, an extension of a grant made, to her, made by her for life. By the following April, she made the grant in fee, basically thereby annexing these royal lordships to the Mortimer Earldom. The grand prize for Roger Mortimer came a month later, sorry, uh, in, um, yeah, a month later in 1330, when Roger received a grant that he might hold the estates of the Earl of Arundel in Wales, Shropshire and the Marches for life, but as fully as the Earl had uh, done. And by his death, Roger could actually claim ownership or enduring influence in about three quarters of the Lordships of the March of Wales, as well as, of course, being the governor of the Principality of Wales for life. And that was an immense achievement of any standard, and far outstripped all that the Spencers had managed. Although it's not competition, people, it's not, it's not competition. <laughs> Um, there are, I'm not going to come to, I'm not going to give this, but there are plenty of examples very similar to the ones Emery and Catherine's given about the thuggery and the sort of violence that Mortimer brings against other people. Uh, now, much of his attention um, was concentrated on the areas where his personal power was strongest, or where he wished it to be stronger. And actually, Professor Robin Frame has suggested that Mortimer even aimed to create a mini empire on the doorstep of Dublin by his acquisition, acquisition at the same time of the lands of the late Diver- of Diverden inheritance in Louth and Meath and Ireland. But it was in England where his attack on prerogative and the position of kingship was more keenly felt, particularly as at court he allegedly trampled all over ceremony, rising before the king and walking arrog- arrogantly one step ahead of the boy with his ministers. He packed the court with his retinue, which was double that of the king, it was said, while his men took prees across the kingdom as if he were king. Now, eventually, suppression of dissent and the chafing of the political classes would cause a rebellion to bubble to the surface. The vulnerability of the regime, at least from the perspective of hindsight, is spectacularly revealed by the plot supposedly uncovered at court by which Edmund, Earl of Kent, younger half-brother of Edward II, confessed to a conspiracy to liberate the former king, who, it was said, had been kept alive. Now, the conspiracy has recently been the focus of tens of thousands of words in print, none of which I can better or add to, and I'm not going to now. And Kent named dozens of plotters, including exiled Lancastrians, William Melton, Archbishop of York, who himself had seemed separately attempted to support the ex-king he believed to be at large, and many prominent individuals across the country. Now, if Edward had been freed and remained alive throughout the years of Roger Mortimer's ascendancy, that, of course, throws very different light on the period. It adds a significant nuance to the vulnerability of his regime. The usual version of the story, in which Roger Mortimer is responsible for ordering the King's murder of Barclay in September 1327, would need complete revision and his reputation as a regicide overcome. Now, the Kent plot and the fate of Edward II are now the most debated and, dare I say, controversial aspects of the history of England in the early 14th century. 
If I've got another half hour, I'd come to it now, but I don't, sadly. Well, planned me. Um, but maybe we can explore that a little later in questions, or privately later. Now, the Earl of Kent is executed in Winchester oh, sorry, that's oh, that's right, yeah. on the 19th of March 1330. But Mortimer and Isabella had released forces they ultimately couldn't control. Within a month, orders had to be issued to sheriffs to proclaim Kent to be an executed for treason and of his false pretense that Edward II was still alive. The national mood came to resemble the final year of the late King's reign, with rebels fleeing overseas and rumours of a fresh invasion rife. Worryingly for Mortimer, inquiries in June 1330 revealed supporters of Richard, son of the executed Earl of Arundel, had been stirring up dissent in Shropshire and Staffordshire. While in August 1330, Mortimer was ordered as justice to arrest and imprison all Welshmen assisting Rhys up Griffith. Um, Rhys had been prominent supporting Edward II at the end of his reign and had been involved in plots to free the king from Barclay Castle. Rhys, it was said, and you can see here, proposes to enter the realm with certain other enemies and rebels with a multitude of armed men and the king hears that many in Wales are of his confederacy and alliance. Now, when the net finally closed in, though, it wasn't actually down to an external threat at all. And on the 19th of October 1330, Edward III, shortly to celebrate his 18th birthday, and having recently fathered his first son and heir the previous June, gathered around him around 20 confidants, and by means of the secret tunnels beneath Nottingham Castle, stormed the Queen's chamber and arrested Roger Morton. Such secrecy, secrecy was demanded as, according to the Brute, quotes, some that were of the king's council loved the Mortimer and told him in private how the king and his council were planning day by day to undo him. Now, the king and his young friends had been summoned before the council the, uh, the day before the, to be accused of plotting by Mortimer, which they disingenuously denied, although one report suggests that the king's friend, William Montague, said it's better to eat the dog than to be eaten. Now, at a stroke, Roger Mortimer's power was cut off. He, his son Geoffrey, and his notorious, and not most notorious, but mysterious henchman Simon de Bereford were carted off to the Tower of London. This is an entry discovered by Jeremy Ashby of the um, Eng now English Heritage. Uh, and it's an account of the keeper of the King's works at the Tower from the King's fifth regnal year. And it reveals a payment of 12 pence for moving 12 cartloads of Rygate stone and ragstone that were used for enclosing Roger Mortimer, Sir Geoffrey his son, and Simon Bereford in the turret next to the King's chamber, from the turret into the garden. Uh, you probably can't see the line, but there's Roger there. Sorry, camera. Um, now, obviously, yes, so Edward had kind of all, Edward had, had all but bricked them up in a chamber over which he could then potentially spy. He wasn't going to make the same mistake as his father had done in 1323 in allowing there to be lax enough security for Roger to escape. Now, the imperative was for Edward to put Mortimer in trial before his peers and to have him executed in public. Parliament opened on Westminster on the 26th of November, and three days later, Mortimer was extracted from his cell and brought to face his judges. The charges, as you can see here, present an expose, expose of his politicking over the previous four years. And there can be little doubt when comparing these charges with the voluminous public record and chronicle accounts, that Mortimer had genuinely and repeatedly <coughs> used such royal power, placing himself above the teenage king and his peers. Now, there is, you'll notice, no mention here of Queen Isabella's guilt, and she must be viewed as complicit in, 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 as, as complicit in many of the things of which Mortimer was accused. Edward was scrupulous to burden Mortimer with the overwhelming bulk, bulk of the guilt and the evils of the regime, and to emphasise the personal nature of the threat that Mortimer posed to the Crown and the King. Mortimer's subsequent execution by hanging at Tyburn ended his life and placed the portfolio of lands, properties, rights and privileges he had, accumula he had accumulated into peril. But, though forfeit accompanied execution, Edward III treated Roger's widow and children more respectfully and with restraint. More importantly, Edward didn't extinguish the Earldom of March, but allowed the family slowly but surely to regain his trust and its place at the pinnacle of society. For that story, though, we're going to have to wait for my talk in Ludlow on the 29th of June. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.